Okay, before this video actually starts, I just wanted to say that you technically don't need to cook for 90% of this. If you have a favorite place that makes cheesesteaks, roast pork sandwiches, or buffalo chicken dip, you could just buy those, heat them up, and then add more cheese, and skip to the part where you form the log and freeze it. My favorite place for cheesesteaks and roast pork sandwiches is John's Roast Pork in Philly. If you're in the area, you should definitely give them a try. Also, since this is three separate recipes, I'm going to be leaving timestamps in the description below for each of them. So with cheesesteaks, there aren't really any rules. You could have whatever ratio of onions to steak you want. You can dice the onion, or you could slice the onion like how I am, but, but it's all up to your own preference. To make a really good cheesesteak, you should use thinly sliced ribeye. However, for this, you could be cheap like me and use thinly sliced top round. Realistically, use whatever you could get, and I'm sure your butcher could help you out. You're going to want to have the meat semi-frozen just so you could dice it up easier. Get a large pan on medium high heat, drizzle with some olive oil, and then add the onions and steak, and then season it with salt and pepper. Find a lid to cover the pan and let the steak steam for a couple minutes. After steaming for a little while, what you're going to want to do is to mix the onions and steak together. When the steak is done, you'll notice that there might be a lot of liquid still in the pan. You could either let this liquid evaporate or you could drain it off. Once there's no more liquid, go ahead and shut off the stove and let the residual heat melt the cheese. There's no set amount of cheese to put, just put enough so that the mixture is creamy and sticks together kind of like mac and cheese. Once the cheese is fully melted, go ahead and put it in a container or a bowl and let it harden up in the refrigerator. For the roast pork, you'll want to get a boneless pork shoulder. Again, your butcher will be more than happy to help you. Season the pork shoulder generously with salt, pepper, garlic, and some rosemary. You want to season it so much that you think that you're over seasoning it. Usually boneless pork shoulders come netted up, but I took off the netting just so I could get more seasoning inside. If you do this, you'll want to tie it up just like how I am, just so it cooks a little bit more even. Once you finish getting the pork seasoned, put it in the oven uncovered at 375 degrees until internal temperature of 155. Once it's out of the oven, you'll want to let it rest for about 20 to 30 minutes before slicing it. With a sharp knife, make thin slices and then chop it into small bits. Get a large pan on medium-high heat, drizzle in some olive oil, along with some minced garlic. Once your garlic is fragrant, you want to go ahead and drop in some bitter greens. This could be either broccoli rabe or spinach. Put a lid on it and let your greens cook down. Once your greens steamed a bit, you want to go ahead and mix it up and then add in your pork. At this point, you're going to want to turn the fire down to low and then let the pork heat up a bit. A good greens to pork ratio would be maybe about one cup of greens to four cups of meat. Once heated, you want to go ahead and throw in your cheese. For this one, you'll want to use provolone cheese. I used a sliced mild provolone and then I shredded my own sharp provolone. Again, you should be letting the residual heat melt the cheese. Give it a good mix to make sure that everything's incorporated evenly. Just like with the cheesesteak, if you notice any liquid on the bottom of the pan, you'll want to go ahead and drain it off. Put the mixture in a bowl or a container and let it harden in the refrigerator. For the buffalo chicken dip, you'll want to start off with some cooked chicken, preferably dark meat because it has the most flavor. Chop up the chicken and the chicken skin, put it in a bowl along with cream cheese and a quarter cup of Frank's buffalo sauce. Just like the other recipes, there isn't really a set ratio, as long as you get a nice mixture that is cheesy and sticks together. Mix until everything is incorporated evenly, but don't overmix because you might break the chicken up too much.
This is probably the hardest part about making these. What you'll want to do is get a big piece of plastic wrap and set your mixture in the middle. If you're having trouble fitting your mixture, either make it in batches or just spread it out along the long edge of the wrap. Now you want to take the side of the plastic wrap that is closest to you and fold it over the mixture. And then get the side that's furthest from you and bring it back over the first fold. While firmly holding the ends, roll the mixture while gently pulling outward and pinching inward with your fingers. If there's any air trapped, you can use a needle to poke a tiny hole or press down and let the air escape. Once you roll it up tightly, you could gently tie it off and then let it set in the freezer. Set up a basic breading station with flour, egg, and breadcrumbs. Cut a half inch thick piece of your mixture, bread it, and then put it back in the freezer so it could set for one last time. Heat some oil in a pot to 350 degrees and then grab your frozen bites and drop them in. Since everything inside of them is fully cooked, you're just looking to make sure that the exterior is brown and crunchy. You're definitely going to want to do these in batches just so nothing sticks together. These are definitely too big to be called bites, but they're still really delicious. One thing you could try if you don't feel like doing the log method is either using a melon baller or a ice cream scoop and just making balls and breading them and frying them that way. One great thing about these is that you could set them up the day before and then fry them the day you have people over to watch a game. I like to serve them with some extra hot sauce or even some chopped up pickled peppers. Whether you make one or all of these bites, they will definitely be a hit. If you like this recipe, leave a like and share the video. And if there's anything specific you want to see me make, leave it in the comments below.